Good evening, Ruchim Avayim Rabotai. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Tonight's class was sponsored anonymously in honor and in the schut of all those who are our regular contributors to our Shabbat fund. Ashrechem umatov chalkechem, mitzvah goreret mitzvah. Yudu tzedakah, and then another Jew who went and sponsored a bunch of classes as recognition for what other people are doing, because it it's really amazing. And Hashem should help that there should be no more aniim in Am Yisrael, and we should uh, be able to use money for uh, happy causes instead. Um, my sincere apologies about the food. It'll be showing up a little late tonight because there was an error in the ordering system. But don't worry, you're not going to get deprived of food. Um, let's try and do it. Let's see what we can do. So, Yaakov Avinu, the last 17 years of his life, he spends in Egypt. Yosef brings him down to Egypt for 17 years. Over there, believe it or not, the holy rabbis teach us, he gets what's called in their language, to his highest spiritual level. Who would think that Yaakov Avinu, out of all places in Egypt, would get to the highest level spiritually? That makes sense. You have to understand what that means. If anything, when he was in the Yeshiva of Shem Ve'eve, whether it was that as a kid or for 14 years straight or other things, uh, then should have been the times that we would say. But for some reason, there's many rayot that is from Chazal, that over there he got to some sort of high level. Amongst them, the Gaon Mevilna takes an interesting approach. The entire time, Chazal teaches us the Ruach HaKodesh. You know what that Ruach HaKodesh? You have to be besimcha. You have to be happy. If you're not happy, you can't have Ruach HaKodesh. Yaakov Avinu mourned the fact that Yosef wasn't with him for 22 years straight. During that period, he was mourning. When you're mourning, you're not happy. So he started coming, he meant Ruach HaKodesh. The Ruach HaKodesh went away from him. So 22 years prior to these 17 years, he didn't have Ruach HaKodesh. The Gaon says, not exactly these words, I'm watering them down. Hashem should forgive me, it's just that it should be a way that we understand it. When something's taken away from you and then you get it back, so sometimes it's worth so much more. Let's say a guy had a car. That's a stupid example, but it's an example. A guy had a car. And then, for whatever reason, he couldn't afford the car, or I don't know what, or it was in an accident. And for a month, he didn't have a car. And then finally, he gets his insurance reimbursement, he gets a new car. He's going to appreciate his new car a lot more than the, the previous car, because now a month, you know what it means to walk in the rain, in the cold, this, that, not to have a way to get around. So now, it's suddenly a whole new level. So the Gaon doesn't say this clearly, but he hints to it a little bit, that when, after Yaakov Avinu lost the Ruach HaKodesh, not that God forbid Yaakov Avinu didn't appreciate Ruach HaKodesh and everything else before, God forbid, God forbid, we should make such a mistake. But when it came back to him, Hashem compensated him on the 22 years that he was missing it, and gave him a much higher level than he ever was at. And that's the Gaon's explanation of how he was able to get the, his Pisgah Uchanit. In the Midrash, in other places, much more other ways, one of, the way, one of the explanations that is mashma in the Midrash, in the Midrash of Ne'elam actually, is uh, that the darker a room is, the light shines much stronger. So when he was in Eretz Canaan, Eretz Yisrael, it was Kedushat Haaretz, let's say, according to some already then, so the light didn't shine as much. He was the same. But when he was in Egypt, in the darkness and everything, so the Yaakov, you know, light, his Kedusha shines so much more in that place of darkness. Um... During those 17 years, he had peace. He had life made. He had a son, Yosef, which was a ruler, a wealthy man, who took care not only of him, but took care of his children, his grandchildren, everybody. All bills of the whole family were paid in full, and they had a pre-built yeshiva, and everything ran smoothly. There was no fundraising needed, no this, no nothing. Avinu could be the Rosh Shiva, or Yehuda built the Yeshiva, or Yaakov was the Rosh Shiva, his sons were able to learn. Almei Menuchot, everything's as good as could be. The Pasuk, but when it describes the way Yosef took care of Yaakov and the family, it's an interesting thing. Vechakel Yosef et Aviv, Yosef went and supported his father. Ve'et Echav and his brothers, ve'et Kol Beit Aviv, and the entire household of his father which uh, Mephashim explained that's coming to stress that it wasn't only, he didn't only take care of his own. 
meaning is the nephews, the, this, the, the, the entire surroundings, anything that was anything affiliated with his father, he took care of. And then the pasuk adds three more words: lechem lefiataf, gave them bread based on the children. It says he supported them. If anything, lechem lefiataf is a big downgrade to that. Support means you take care of everything they need. So what's the pasuk adding on here? He gave them lechem lefiataf. Well, what's it coming to teach us? The Mfashim discussed this. There's many explanations. Tonight we're going to take one explanation. That's the explanation that's brought down from other Sfarim, but it's compiled by a great rabbi in Bnei Brak, who happens to be an uncle of mine through marriage, my father's sister's brother, of Chaim ben Sinyor Shlita. Hashem should give him a long life. He's not a youngster. Um, and he p- compiles from the Mfashim a beautiful explanation. There's a Gemara in Psachim Daf Yud Amud Bet. The Gemara says over there, what does that mean? Let's say a guy checked his house for chametz before Pesach. Cleaned everything, made everything perfect, checked. Spectacular job. Couldn't be better. And then he sees that his he has a designated area where he's make, keeping the chametz till, pes- till the time that you have to get rid of it, because the family still has to eat. And he sees that his, one of his little kids disappeared from the dinner table. Goes looking after him, and he sees he's downstairs in the playroom with his sandwich. Now, a normal Jewish mom in a situation like that, two days before Passover, that's instant cardiac arrest. After all my work, I just cleaned the whole house now. He's a calm guy. To him, everything was technical. What's the halacha say now? Do I got to start all over again, check again, clean again, do everything again? And he had a reason to think so. Because he sees clearly that in the playroom, on the floor, there's some crumbs. The Gemara says, in a case like that, you don't have to look. You don't have to just clean those crumbs up and everything else is fine. Why? Why? Meaning that we don't have to suspect that there are other crumbs in other places for different reasons because a kid, when he eats, makes a mess. I think there's a big lesson for Jewish moms and dads in general. A lot of times we get annoyed at youngsters when they more food ends up on the floor than in their mouth. Um, the Gemara says already, 2,000 years ago, in Daf Yud, If your kid makes a mess when he eats, that means he's normal. If he doesn't, then you may want to send him to therapy because something's wrong. Yeah, that, that's exactly what the Gemara says. And when you think that way, suddenly a lot of stress in life goes away. Because what otherwise would have been an issue is, thank God, my child's healthy. He's a normal kid, Baruch Hashem. This is a big lesson in a lot of areas and when it comes to the way we deal with kids. I'm sure I said this in, in prior classes, but this is one of my favorite stories of the Kutzke Rebbe. There's no end to stories of the Kutzke Rebbe. He's a sharp man, so every word he said is a story. But uh, one of them was that a guy went into him and said that his son went crazy. And he needs a blessing that his son should have. If watch the image, it should become normal. So he said, why did your son go crazy? What happened? Tell me. So he said, during the day he eats pigs, and at night he dances with girls. So the Kutzko ever told him, get out of here, no blessing. So he said, what do you mean, no blessing? I'm telling you, I need a blessing for that. So the Kutzko ever told him like this. If you would have came to me and told me, that during the day he eats girls and at night he dances with pigs. So then I would say, he's crazy. Now I'm giving a blessing to be healthy. But if by day he eats pig and at night he dances with girls, that means he eats horror, he's normal. Hashem should help, he should do tshuva one day. He be, but he's not crazy, he's perfectly normal. That's a big idea when we look, view things with children or teens or whatever. Or today, even 40-year-olds are teens because they're the millennial generation and thinks everything is owed to them. Same idea, they're babies when they're 42. And they'll even go riot over it and protest over it as if somebody owes them something. It was never like that in history. Nobody ever thought they were entitled. This feeling of entitlement is a real destruction. And the Gemara says, that's normal. A kid makes a mess. And therefore, we assume the mess is only here. We don't have to suspect the mess is anywhere else. Forget about everywhere else. Just stay focused on cleaning up the mess where, where, where the mess is. No. Based on this, it's Mivuar and the Gemara over there in the Rishonim. 
that the opposite of what we normally think. If a guy has five boys, and his boys, let's say, are all tw- 20 and up, and a different guy has five boys, but his boys are, and I don't mean boys specifically, children, whatever, and his boys are uh, six years old and down, which, one, which family do you think needs more food? I would instinctively, for sure, think that somebody has older kids, you know, they have an appetite. Young kids, what do they eat already? In the Gemara, it's been for a while just the opposite. That an old kid, an older person eats. So if you give him a loaf of bread, he utilizes the entire loaf of bread. So that's what he needs. A younger kid, most of the food goes to waste. So out of a whole loaf of bread, if he gets a few bites in, that's a miracle. So he actually needs more food in order to sustain him because there's so much waste involved along the way. That's what it's a little bit much more from the Gemara. If that's the case, comes up Ben Sion and he says, this is a brilliant pshat, it's, it's, it's ingenious. He says, what does the Pasuk say? Ve'chalkel Yosef et Aviv. Yosef gave money, what a fool, whatever they needed to his father. Ve'et Echav and to his brothers. Ve'et Kol Beit Aviv. And even the extended family and the people that maybe he wasn't obligated to in any way, also gave them. But not just did he give them what they need. Lechem lefi ataf. He, he gave them such a surplus as if they were little kids that the majority goes to waste and they should have extra. So not only is it not a downgrade lechem lefi ataf, it's the biggest upgrade. Meaning he gave them way above and beyond what they actually needed. No. Amazing thing. Im kenim advarim. So we could take this a little step further. Um... Yosef HaTzadik, we know each Shevet has a different Midah that he was Chatumbo, right? The Zohar talks about it clearly. Um, Yosef, at, Yosef HaTzadik is Midat HaYesod. We know that from, everybody knows that, right? From Shana, Kippur, Slichot, from all the prayers, we know that. Midat HaYesod. The Zohar writes an interesting thing. That somebody who was born with Midat HaYesod, who has that nature in him, whatever it means, He's not capable of accepting gifts from others. He can't benefit from other people. He's a real sonema tanot. He can't. Some people have such a nature, even if they're in the worst situation in life, they're not capable of taking from somebody else. If Yosef was, came from Midat Yisod, so that means, naturally, he's a giver and he's not capable of being a recipient in any situation. But there are situations in a person's life where he has to be a recipient. The classic situation is a child, a newborn, whether he likes it or not, I don't care what his natures are, if his mother doesn't feed him, he's not going to have food, because on his own he has no way to get food. So there's technical stages in life, nothing to do with what bracket you're in or what family you were born in, that whether you like it or not, you need the assistance of others. No, if that's the case, comes the Zohar and writes an unbelievable thing. How many years did Yosef live at home? before his brother sold him to Egypt. It's a pasuk. 17. 17 years. He was a 17-year-old boy when he went to go see his brothers, and from there he ended up in Egypt. 17 years, he was a recipient. His father gave him food, ketonet pasim, taught him Torah, and that's against me, that he saw it. He couldn't deal with it. So Hashem made, in order for him to be able to die in peace, and his nature should work, that Yaakov with the whole family should come down to Egypt for 17 years, so for 17 years, he should be able to give back the 17 years that he received when he was a child. Unbelievable. That's the Zohar says, not me. Um, I think the Zohar is also sending a little bit of a hint to parents. Not, not always smart to fight with your teenager. Because today, he might need you. But there's going to be a day that you're going to need him. So just for that reason alone, it might be wise to stay on good terms with him. You know, when a father's young and healthy and everything, so he's macho man, he thinks he can boss his kids around. He should think a few years ahead. There's going to be a day that he's going to need his kids to take care of him and to help him out. And maybe it's good to be on civil terms just for that selfish reason alone. And who teaches that to us? The Zohar himself. Yosef got 17 years from his father. Naturally, he had to give it back. And a Kosh went and turned the world around in a way that they should go down to Egypt for 17 years just so that the kids should be able to give back to his father. Unbelievable thing. Um, the Zohar over there afterwards continues into another interesting subject 
I don't want to elaborate a lot because it's uh, some of it can come across scary, and I'm not into talking about scary things. But the Zohar says the Yaakov Avinu felt that he was going to pass away at a certain point, and that's how this whole parasha came about with the blessings. Before he passed away, he had to close some things with his sons and bless them and give them over his legacy. Um, in the Zohar, in Parashat Vayichi, in, uh, I don't know, it depends on the print, but in the original print, in page Vayishut Chet, the Zohar clearly states what happens. This is interesting a little bit. He says that when a person's time is to go to Shemaim, so there's a Tosefet Ruach, an extra spiritual thing that comes down from Shemaim to him, that was never in his body before, that never he never had to deal with before. It's like another... And, and technically we prove this from Pasuk and Tehilim, Tosef Rucham Yigvaun. Tosef Rucham, when HaKadosh Baruch adds another Ruach into a person, that's a sign that soon they're going. I don't know if any of you had to be around people that were at the last weeks of their lives, but normally, definitely by Jews, but I think by everybody, before the end of their life, there's a few hours or days or something that they feel a little bit better. Well, that something looks a little better. And that's that the Sufit Ruach, that Gosh sends a person. It's not always, you know, medically sometimes it's an exciting sign that you want to grasp hope on, but uh, spiritually a lot of times it's a sign that the uh, time is close. No. So Yaakov Avinu felt that he got this Tosefet Ruach. Abdeslo in Mikhtav um, in uh, the volume 3, page uh, 282, Abdeslo writes, I'm quoting word for word, And the words of this Zohar, it explains exactly the way it works when a person passes away from the world. Ein hamita mesovevet al yidei choli. This is a very big yisod. Everybody has to know this. This is from the foundations of faith. Nobody dies because they were sick. When somebody passes away, what do we say? He died of an overdose. He died of this illness. He died of a stroke. He died of a heart attack. He died of... We always have cause of death, right? Even in a death certificate, cause of death. Comes with death and writes, the Zohar is coming to teach Kali Yisrael that a Jew, a Ma'amin, thinks differently than that. The reason why a person passes from the world has nothing to do with the fact that he was sick. Why? If not for the fact that Yaakov Avinu had a specific prayer to Borei Olam, that a person should get sick before he passes away, in order to give him the opportunity to realize I'm departing the world and it's time to clean my act up with God and people and to leave the world purely. <laughs> Nobody would ever get sick. People would always be healthy. There would be no illness. Yotzeh, if it comes out based on this, that the only reason why a person becomes sick is because he had to die. He didn't die because he was sick. Exactly the opposite of everything we're acquainted to think. It means when a person passed away, he didn't die because of a heart attack. He had a heart attack because in Shemaim, before he was born, they decided that on this day, at this time, he's going to go and give back his neshama to Hashem. The opposite extreme of what everybody's used to thinking. No. Comes up Desla and continues, and he takes this idea a lot further. And over here he says a very fine difference. He says there's a difference between the death of a tzaddik and the death of somebody who's not such a tzaddik. He says, by a tzaddik, sibata mita etzel tzaddikim, the, the reason why the righteous pass away, sh'anefesh ro'a et giluyav shel olam ha'emet. Because there's this tosefet ruach, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives it more, like a higher level soul, let's call it, that's a very inaccurate way to describe it, but it's my best thing that I can come up with right now. So at that point, he sees more of God. And when he sees more of God, and more of the world of truth, At that point, he has no interest in anything materialistic. It's like a magnetic draw to the spirituality. And therefore, the body starts collapsing on him. The regular way of the body operating is no longer working, because that's not what he wants. 
It's not valid. Ve'hainu tosef rucham yigvayim. And that's what the pasuk means, that when you get a tosefet ruach, that brings you to shamayim. Sh'agviyahi al yedei tosefet ruach. That means that dafka through, that means that tzaddikim, when they pass away from the world, it's not that they had a tragedy that they passed away. That's what they wanted. They saw Marot Elokim, they saw God, and they wanted to be close to Him. So they went to go be close to Him. If that's the case, Avdesla asks on himself a very tough question. And the question is a lot harder than anything to answer, that we're going to answer. The Zagmara begins a Moed Katan on Chafchev Dambet, it continues the next Amud on the top, that says, Kashei Yitziat Nishama Min Aguf, Kitzpoi Vfi Aveshet, that it's very painful, Rashi explains, it's a very painful process for a person to pass away, and I don't want to get graphic, it's too late at night for it. But it's a hard thing. Comes up Desla and says, wait a second, I just said that the tzaddik wants to go to Hashem. So what's hard about it? He's getting his wish, there's nothing hard at all, it's just the opposite. And over here, Abdesla says something that's very, that's a big wake-up call to life. He says there's a difference between a tzaddik that passes away and not, a person who's not a tzaddik that passes away. There's a person who's not a tzaddik that passes away. For him, death is not a, is a, is a painful process because he doesn't he doesn't feel that connection that he wants to go there. But a person that's a righteous man, for him, it's actually a very pleasant process, and that's what we call in Chazal. For example, one of the many examples, mitat neshika. Hakadosh gave certain tzaddikim throughout the generations that they had a death that was called a death, a death of a kiss. A kiss is something that we associate with a, a positive thing. And death is something that we associate with a negative thing. So it's like it says in Shil Hashirim, Yishakeni min shikot piyo, that Kosh himself kisses a person, and at that point they have such a strong bond between the soul and God, that the soul wants back to its origin naturally, and it wants to go back to God. This is the way Avdesla explains it. Um, and based on this, it's very easy to understand, the Chazal teach us in Avot, Perek Dal, Mishnah Yudzayim, one hour of pleasure in Gan Eden is worth way more than everything that's going on in this world and any pleasure that a person can po- possibly obtain in this world. The Midrash takes it a step further. The Midrash says that God comes to a person, that tzaddik, before he passes away and shows him and gives him a taste of the pleasure and a vision of the Benefits that he's going to have in being in Olam Abba. The Midrash doesn't really explain why. But the Mifarshim, the Etzchayim and others on the Midrash explain that God is scared that the person is going to do like what Moshe Rabbeinu tried to do and say, I don't want to die. And God listens to the Tzadikim. Tzadik Gozer HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim. And Moshe Rabbeinu was a different story. It was a punishment. But in general, if a Tzadik is going to say he doesn't want to die, it's going to become an issue. Should he die? Shouldn't he die? Like David HaMelech, that had to be a trick to get him to distract himself from his learning and then to take his neshama and all different stories in Chazal like that. So God goes and shows a person, don't worry, by dying you're not losing anything, you're gaining so much. And at that, pers- at that point he says, okay, if that's the case, it's worth it for me. No, this is a little bit out of character for me to talk about. I don't like talking about death, I like talking about life. But this is the real way to live. Why? Some of you go to the gym, and those who do, I encourage it very strongly. It's a mitzvah, and shmatem od lenafshotechem. It's a healthy thing. The whole medical world agrees. To be fit is very healthy. All the gdolei Israel also didn't go to gyms, chas shalom, because that wasn't, uh, didn't have time for that. But they went on walks. The chazanish used to walk every day. Chaim and told the shibadel chaim tovim. He walks to all the gdolei Israel, all the generations. Shlom Zalman and Oybach had the schut to walk with him. Abshach had the schut to walk with him. He used to go on walks. It was healthy for them. Gersh Nezushtein until today, I have a long life in a Fuash Lema. He, uh, our oldest Gdullah Do today. Um, they, it's a mitzvah in the Torah to take care of your health. And that's one of the things that's proven to take care of your health. It seems like a paradox. On one hand, they're maintaining a life that's going to leave them longer here. On the other hand, they want there. So which one is it? And the answer is very simple. They want there, but they know the only way to get there is through here. 
And therefore we maintain here to get there in a better way. The mitzvah of nishmatem od lenafshotechem is not to have a six pack. For a six pack buy a corona and drink and that's it. It's good enough. For six bucks you got a six pack. Maybe my price is off. I don't know what the tax in New York is. Um, but when you look at the world as a mahalach, as a way to get closer to Hashem, as a way to get to a real goal, so then, then there's a reason for the world. When you look at the world as, well, how am I feeling today, and which side of the bed did I wake up, and what's my mood right now, then yeah, there's no real reason. Nothing's left. Now, when you go to that guy who goes to the gym and you see him sweating and, uh, and stinking and in pain and his muscles are burning and everything's hurting and uh, it's not a pleasant sight. Even here they're making noises when they're bench pressing and uh, there's risk of injury involved and other things. I, I don't know if you ever paid attention to the membership forms when you sign up to a gym, but you sign your whole life over to them practically. You could drop dead here, we have no responsibility on you, whatever it is, it is. That's literally what you sign on. Look one time at the papers. I don't know if you'll sign it afterwards. But why is a person going through all that? Because he has a goal. His goal is that he wants to be stronger, healthier, look better, whatever it is, each one with his craze. What's that a lesson that every teenager relates to? Because they all do it. That if you have a goal, even if the way to the goal is very painful, it's well worth it. And that's a standard that you live by until this very day. If that's the case, if we have a real goal, it's Kirvat Elohim. And sometimes the way to the goal to Kirvat Elohim is painful because it comes along with struggle and it comes along with the or that we have to fight all the time. And it comes along with a lot of other problems. Is the pain there? Yeah, it's there. But it's worth it. Because there's a goal. Unbelievable thing. And that's the reason why Tzaddikim, who didn't have easy lives at all, were happy people. And a shayim that have very easy lives, depressed, miserable souls. That's, that's the reason. Because one has what to live for, and the other one doesn't have meaning. There's no purpose, there's no tachlis, there's no nothing. In Kenim Advarim, we're going to try and take it a little bit further, and Basiyad Dishmaya, maybe walk away with something that can uh, help us out. What I said until now seems to be very simple. If that's the case, why don't we live like that? I think there's some sort of uh, kid slang. It's easy to talk to talk, but it's tough to walk to walk. I hope that didn't come from a gangster rapper or something like that. That's what it sounds like almost. But, but there's a, I, I don't give them the credit of having that much intelligence to say that line. But I saw a teacher like that recently, actually. And in Yiddishkeit, in Judaism at large, a lot of things make so much sense. It's so obvious. But when it comes down to it, suddenly it becomes so not obvious. So what's going wrong in that connection? Where's the link that's going wrong? So, to lighten things up, I want to share with you a great story. Does anybody here know the story of the Shidduch of the, the stipler, how the stipler got married? You know who the stipler married? Let's start with that. This is an important thing. Jewish history. I don't want to say because it's a synagogue. I'll pick some celebrity. Who's he married to? You'll live. You know, right? The stipler was a Jewish celebrity. A havdil. Who lived a life of purity. So if you know that garbage, then you should know this a million times over. The stipler married the sister of the Chazonish. Who was the Shadchan? Right? Today we all go to Shadchanim and that. They charge us an arm and a leg. Who's the Shadchan? The Chazanish. Chazanish had a sister. He felt obligated to find a good boy. And he went and picked up the stipe. How did this Fiduch come about? The Chazanish sent a telegram or whatever it was called then to the stipe where he was learning to say that he has a sister and it's a good Shiduch for him and whatever and he wants him to come on a train to the town that his sister was. Back then it was also acceptable. The boy goes to the girl, not vice versa. That's not a new thing. Kaisal did that, uh, not all the generations, because the Imahot did come to the Avot, 
But uh, after that, if you look later on in the Gemara and so on, and the Rishonim for sure, you see clearly that it was done the other way. Afterwards, what, what changed could be discussed at a different time. And the disciple agreed. Now here's the interesting thing. The disciple lived a very unique life. His life was Torah to the maximum extreme. And that's why the Chazonish wanted him as a brother-in-law. How did the stipler learn? Listen to this, it's amazing. The stipler used to learn 36 hours straight. He stopped maybe for food and prayer, but other than that, 36 hours straight. And after 36 hours straight of learning, he would sleep for six hours. That's the way he learned. Wake up six hours later, another 36 hour cycle. He lived his life many, 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 many years like that. Okay. He gets this thing and he's interested in the Shiduch. His sister, and that makes sense. And he's going to go on a train. It was a four hour train ride from where he was to there. The trains weren't every day, so he had another day and a half or two days, whatever it was, till he had a train to go. So he said, Wait a second. On a train, there's women and this, uh, you can't learn. So I'm going to miss, it, miss out on learning. So he thought of a brilliant idea. He said, instead of 36 hours, I'm going to push it 42 hours, till the train. And then anyway, I'm going to be on the train for four hours, so I'll sleep. And sleeping on a train is a great idea, Shmirat night. That was the Stipler's plan. So then that's what he did. He learned an extra few hours, went to the train station, had a ticket, got, got there, got onto the train. The train's about to leave. He's looking for somewhere to sit down to go to sleep. He has four hours to sleep, and then he has to go meet a girl that might be his wife. When he came to sit down, he saw that the chairs of the train, the benches, whatever they're called, had a cushion on them. And the stipler has a big fidush that we don't hold like, that if the shatn is in the cushion, even if it's not yours, you're not allowed to sit on it. When the stipler went into a car later on in Israel, years, years later, they used to have to check the whole car for shatn is, otherwise he wouldn't go into the car. He, right? None of us ever heard of that before. Yeah. That was the stipler held the halacha. I don't know the halacha or chumra, but one way or the other. Now he's after 42 hours of no sleep, gets on a train, has, has four hour ride ahead. Forget about to go to sleep. Now he can't even sit down. He looks for a place, maybe without a cushion, uh, you know, nothing doing. Makes peace with it, goes to the back corner where he can't see anybody, turns his face to the wall. And he stands holding on to the wall. And he thinks in learning. And that's how he passes the time. He arrives to the train station where the Chazanish was. Chazanish came to greet him. And he says, okay, come. Now you'll meet my sister. And they met, yeah. Chazanish took him to the house or wherever it was that they met. And the girl heard about the stipler. And the stipler <coughs> is going to... Uh, it's her first date. Very special moment. And the stipler is now after 46 or uh, 47 hours and no sleep. And a human is a human. And he starts talking to her. And after three seconds, he falls asleep. <laughs> Imagine what a girl would have done today. <laughs> the shadchan could have been, you know, attempted murder could have happened from such a story. Falls asleep. Five minutes later, he picks his head up, he wakes up, he apologizes, and he tries to continue talking to her. Conversation didn't even last two more minutes, and he fell asleep again. The second time he fell asleep, the Chazanish's sister already wasn't so happy about it. And she went into her brother, the Chazanish, and she said, the boy is sleeping. And instead of the Chazanish telling her, you know, that's crazy, I don't know, I'm going to ask him what happened. He tells her, don't wake him up. If he's sleeping, that means he needs his rest. Leave him alone. <laughs> Leave him alone. She was quiet. And he slept. He woke up and he apologized and whatever. At that point, she wasn't even in the house anymore. And told her, Chazunish, I'm sorry. And he told him the whole story of what happened. And the Chazunish told him, Two words back as a response. Mazal tov. You're engaged. 
is getting better by the minute, right? Some girls have to sit on social media all day looking for a boy, and then nobody's good enough, and where? And other girls have a boy that comes to the first date, goes to sleep, and they get engaged. <coughs> a little bit of a different mentality, let's just call it that. We'll be polite tonight. So the stipend tells the Chazonish, okay, I'm happy to hear, but uh, well, is she crazy? Why'd she agree? You know? <laughs> After all, I didn't do the right thing here. So what's the... Explain me the logic behind it. So the Chazanish said like this, I went to my sister. And I saw she was a little bit, like, taken aback. And I asked her why she thinks you fell asleep. So she right away said, probably because you were learning, or you, uh, you were tired. So I said, and if he would have not fell asleep, and he would have spoken to you, and what would have been different? I said that I would have heard who he is, what he is. So there would have been some connection. And the Chazonish told his sister these words. In life, people have to choose. Do they want to hear what the other person has to say, and that will be their spouse? And then a lot of times the person is going to say things that they don't want to hear. Or are they willing to be on a first date and not hear what the other person has to say because he fell asleep? But one day they'll be married to Agdol Ado, the whole world is going to hear about it. And the whole world's going to hear his Torah and hear who he is. And it's going to make an impact on the whole Ami Sled. And that's the choice you have to make. And whatever you choose is fine. And at that point she said, Mazel Tov, we're getting married, and that was the end. That's how the Stipus Shiduch came about. Now let's fast forward a whole lot of years. We could talk for weeks what the Stipus accomplished for the Jewish nation. Just take the Svarim that he wrote, Kilot Yaakov and the Kainan Degutan, you know, just all the Svarim, that the, either the stipe or his son that was his father's Torah, that part of it, or that alone. The Brachot that he gave Klal Yisrael, the help that he gave Klal Yisrael, the, the, the amount of people that, that, were, that were saved by him, the difference that he made in the state of Israel. Judaism today in the state of Israel exists in the merit of three people. The Chazonish, Rav Shach, and the Stipler. If not for those three, there wouldn't be nothing in Israel today. They put up a fight that they were willing to go to the bloody end for, including a psak of Yarek Val for women to go to the army. And they saved Klal Yisrael. And all of that could have been lost over a girl, rightfully so, saying, what type of thing is this? You came to the first day that you fell asleep? But sometimes in life, there are a few people, and there's not for everybody, that are able to rise above the regular rules. And the people that rise above, later on, partner in the Jewish nation, rising above. If we're already mentioning the stipler, I'll, I don't know if you... Yeah, I think I said this in, in the past. I, was, I only saw the stipler twice in my life. I was a very young kid, just through the math of when he passed away, and my age and that, that's not like I had that many opportunities. And I remember both times. Which is weird, because I don't remember much from my younger years. Um, why do I remember? Because it was a sight that was unbelievable. It was a line, not a long line, but uh, you know, there was a line of 10, 15, I don't know exactly, people, and the, my father took me. And in front of us was a very prestigious person. I didn't know get out who he was. And the man was standing on line in front of my father. He was my father's friend. He was older than my father by a lot. And he was crying. And I told my father, Dad, your friend's crying. You know, talk to him, calm him down. He says, no, he's not crying because of that. He's doing tshuva. I was a young kid, that's why I remember this made such an impact on me. He said, he's doing tshuva, what's he doing tshuva for? So my father told me, the stipler is Ruach HaKodesh. When a person walks into him, he's able to see everything he did his whole life. So people are scared to go in. So when they wait to go in, they do tshuva before, so hopefully the tshuva will erase some of their sins and it won't be so bad. And the stipler was hard of hearing. People that are hard of hearing speak very loud. So the stipler used to yell. Not just yell. And you could hear it a block away. It was frightening. I remember standing on line, he yelled at somebody. Was, I was trembling. I was scared to go in. I didn't want to go in. Yell is not a word. It was a pachat. It was a pachat of Yer Shemayim. But people went in anyway. Because everything he said happened like that on the spot. There was no ifs, ands, and buts. Whatever he said, as it was, that's the way it happened. It was things that make no sense. And he used to always stress there's not miracles and there's not there nobody should say that I made a miracle 
It's all Koch HaTorah. I sit and learn non-stop, the Koch HaTorah helps. That's the way it works. Let me see. I'm going to share with you a story that I want you not to learn from. <laughs> this is the second visit to the stipler. Part of the story I obviously don't know, don't remember, I heard from my father. I just remember one detail of the story. The rest is just based on what my father told me. There was a gentleman, um, this was a year before the stipler passed away, who in Queens, and then this, this shul wasn't built yet, there was, uh, we used to use Rabbi Tait's shul in the basement, came to Shiu, he was an Israeli boy, his name was Giora, I don't remember the name, it was rare for me. And in one shear, he sat through a shear, he got up at the end of the shear, he said, Hashem Elokim, I was wrong, my whole way of life was wrong, and I'm becoming a Baal Shuvah, I'm turning my life around. Today, people that do that, they don't last even an hour, but back then there was still intellectual honesty, and he really stuck to it. He stayed in America two years afterwards, because he didn't want to go back to Israel, he was scared, if he goes back, he'll be influenced in the wrong way. And once he was strong enough for that, it was time for him to go back to Israel. He went back to Israel, and he struggled getting married. It wasn't working out. It was before the era of thousands and thousands of Balei Tshuva and whatever, so somebody who was about Tshuva and had a thick history, uh, it, was, it was hard. It wasn't so simple for a frum girl to marry him. It wasn't the norm. And at one point he came to my father and he said, listen, I'm happy I'm frum and I love learning and I'm learning all day in yeshiva now. Everything's beautiful. But the same Torah that says to put on tefillin also says to get married, to have children. And it ain't working. And you got me into this religion. Now you got to get me uh, out of this mess. I got to figure out what to do. So my father told him, listen, a shatchan I'm not. Uh, my blessings, I don't know what they're worth. But there's a tzaddik called the stipler. I'll take you to the stipler. I have a close connection with the stipler. I'll take you. We'll go to the stipler. And he'll give you a blessing to get married. Whatever he says happens. So he told him. I was in Israel then. With my father, he used to take me with him a lot. That was the second time in my life I saw the stipler. He took him into the stipler. The part I'm saying based on what my father told me, a drop I'm saying what I remember. The stipler was very, very hard of hearing at the end of his life, like worse than it was for years before. So they would give him papers with everything. And he would read. Now the stipler had a rule that he didn't read papers that a woman wrote. Not only didn't he see a woman, he didn't even read a paper that a woman wrote. And sometimes people didn't know and they would give him a paper that a woman wrote. And before it reached his hand, he would move his hand away and the paper would fall on the floor. And afterwards they would realize, oh, a woman wrote it. So unbelievable. This Giyar goes in, my father, I'm standing behind the little kid. And I was already traumatized by my previous stipler visit. And my father tells him he's about tshuva, and he turned his life around, and he's a tzaddik. And, you know, he's complimenting him to the stipler. And part is in writing, part is my father screaming into the stipler's ears so he should hear. And the stipler's smiling and all happy. And then he tells him that he needs to get married. Rabbi, give him a blessing that he should get married. And the stipler starts shrieking on the tops of his lungs. And he says... If he's going to have a wedding 100% up Yalachai, bless him, in the next couple of months he should be married. But if the wedding's not going to be 100% up Yalachai, he should never get married in his life. And, they, and he threw them out. That was it. We were all thrown out. This poor guy, Hazi, was depressed. Not only didn't he get a blessing, you know, Yalachai, like the stipler, like what's going to be over here? Kids, uh, the stipler's blessing worked. The same night that he left the stipler's house all depressed, somebody called my father and told my father, he heard that he has a student in Israel, this is a, he has an idea of a girl, Shidduch from Shemaim. The next day they started dating, they got engaged within a few weeks. The stipler's blessing worked. But in the back of his mind, he has one, only one thing. If you get married according to the Torah, good. If, so he tells his wife, his fiance at that point, that the wedding, you know, the mechitza, sure, kasha, sure, everything's sure. Then they figured out one other problem. That both sides of the family are not religious. So they'll be respectful and everything and that, why not? Uh, but they don't know better. So they're going to come hugging and kissing people, they're not showing a it's going to be a problem. So what do you do? So they ended up deciding that they're not going to come out to the wedding until the chuppah itself. And by the chuppah, they're going to walk straight out to the wedding. Like this, they'll avoid that whole interaction prior that can cause issues. This is what they decide. 
the kids, uh, the plan didn't work as planned. And when they were waiting before the chuppah, you know, Sephardic people, they see each other until the chuppah, there's no issue. One uncle came in and he kissed his, uh, the kala before she had a chance to, like, respond to you. This guy stood up, walked out, and disappeared. No case, right? That's what we would say. And he said, his, his words were, the stipler said that it's not going to work anyway, so I get married and get divorced. And so I said, this is a story you're not allowed to learn from. Um, but it's just to, um, just to show you how the word Dole Israel that people actually respected once upon a time. And there was a, my father chased him down. It took my father almost 45 minutes to convince him to come back. This girl had to be a big tzaddikist to cheat him walk out after that. And Baruch Hashem, today they already married off kids and they have. Uh, he, he's a huge Talmud Chacham and his children are big Talmud Chachamim. It's a generation already. It's a, all from the stuff. But that was. A word of the stipler, just one word of the stipler. On the flip side, if you did the wrong thing there, it could work the other way too. For example, the stipler held that a cholam oed, you're not allowed to write at all, period, no matter what. Even though Nalacha it says davar aved, the stipler says there's nothing in this world as davar aved. To keep cholam oed is more important. Abdon Segal told me a story a few years ago. He was in, when he was in New York then for a couple of years, so it was Sukkot, cholam oed Sukkot. First night I went to visit him, Rabbi, Simchat Beit HaShoyva, let's go. And then he was in a very uplifted mood or whatever, spiritual thing. He was, it was like a different world, even for Abdon. And I told him that I wanted to pray for a specific person that I felt a certain Akarat HaTov to, that they should find a Shidduch. And he said, okay, what's the name? He said, the name, he gave a very big blessing. And then I told him, Rabbi, no, not one time now. I want every day, till I call you to say that the person's engaged, I want you to pray for it. And I took a pen and paper, and I wrote her name on a pen and paper, and I gave it to him so he should have the name, so he should remember for the next day. And he threw away the paper. Pushed it back in my face. I told him, Rabbi, what's the problem? What did I do wrong? I gave you a paper of a girl, leads you Yeshua, and a... So he said, hey, you're not allowed to write on Cholam Oed. So I told him, in Halakha it says, Davar Avid. And this girl needs to get married. If you're going to forget her name, I don't know if she'll get married. There's no bigger davar avid than that. It's mutu lechatchila. So he told me that's what happens when young guys pass in alochus. That was his answer to me. This is in public. There must have been a couple hundred people there in the sukkah. I'm done. It's like a stepfather to me. You know, we grew, I grew up on his lap for many, many, many years until today, where nafshik shurab nafshon, nafshok shurab nafshi. You know. I have a big schuss with that. And I don't know why until today, but he loves me a lot. Um, and I te- he says, let me tell you your mistake. And he told me a name, but I don't remember the name. I wish I did. There was a gentleman who lived in the area of Mea Sharim, right near Bet Yisrael, the border over there. Let's say a five-minute walk from me, Yeshiva, a little less even. Who He's alive until today. He's not young anymore. His kids now continue what he used to do. He's the biggest machlis oleach of Yerushalayim. In me, Yeshiva, the food is not always the best. Maybe now it got better, I don't know. But definitely years ago it wasn't the best. Um, it used to be a joke that in the lunch when they would serve hamburgers or kebab or whatever, anything with ground meat, they say shakol or mizonot on it. Because meat's expensive. They would stick so much flour and ground uh, bread and whatever into it, they didn't even know what blessing to make on it. So Friday night, the boys didn't like eating Yeshiva. There was nothing to eat. So this guy, this Hasidic guy, Yerushalmi guy, used to host in his house, and his house wasn't a big house. Maybe the whole house was the size of this room. Somehow it was like the Bet Mikdash. No matter how many people came, there was always room. On a slow week, a hundred boys would eat paya. His wife used to cook with big commercial pots, like you see in the restaurant, bigger than the restaurants. Today his kids, Hashem Shavuot, let them continue this thing. The tons and tons of boys learned to me, Yeshiva that ate by this family. I just don't remember the name now. But to feed so many yeshiva boys three meals every Shabbat is a fortune of money. He's a Yerushalmi guy. He doesn't even take money from the government. Forget about it. The kids, he has no money. So at one point, he came to Abdon. It was Cholam Oed Pesach. And he told him, my story happened Cholam Oed Sukkot. This is Cholam Oed Pesach. And he told him that he read in some sefer that on Shvi Yishot Pesach, if a Tamit Chacham blesses you with money, then you'll have money. So he wants him to drive with him from Yerushalayim to Bnei Brak. To go into the stipler, Erev Shvi Pesach, 
to give him a kvittel, a piece of paper with the name, that the stipler should promise the next day to daven for him that he's going to have money to be able to continue this achnasa tochi. This is what he wanted. Abdon said, I agreed because this person did special things. So we went to Bnei Brak. Now you got to remember, Abdon then was young. And even then, the stipler held their Abdon very highly. You know, they took him in. Uh, whatever he wanted, he used to do for him. And they went in the, before they went in, when they were waiting for the stipler to open the door, the guy wrote his name down on a piece of paper. This is the story Abdon Segal told me. And he said, when he wrote his name down on a piece of paper, I told him, it's Chol HaMoed, you're not let it write. And you know what he answered me? Davar Aved. And he said, and over there, it's even a bigger Davar Aved. It's money, that's what the Allah is talking about. And it's money for Edvar Mitzvah. Fine. I told him, listen, I'm not giving this type of the paper. If you want, you give it to him. It's up, you know, at, at your own risk. He said it wasn't applicable to give the stipler the paper because as soon as we, the, we all walked into the door, the stipler started shrieking. What is this that people don't have any respect for Chol HaMoed, any stupid reason? They say, Davar Aved, Davar Aved. What's Davar Aved? Your Yiddish guy is Davar Aved. You have to keep Chol HaMoed the right way. Abdon said at that point, even him that was a tzaddik and regular by the stipler, he said, I wanted to run away. So I just couldn't run away. He says, if it would have been me myself, I would have left. I would have been scared and left. But I couldn't disappoint this Jew. I knew he was going to break if I leave. So I forced myself. He said, it took strength. That he, he said, almost ruined his yandav afterwards to get back to physical strength. To stay with him. And he told the stipler, it's a mistake. You know, and he told him everything he does and why he did it. And he's really desperate and that. And then the stipler changed his mind. It doesn't mean change my mind. He didn't agree with the writing. But he told them the paper goodbye. But he told, but he he said a very sharp thing that was very out of character for the stipler. The stipler told him, if I could remember the whole Torah, I could remember your name also. That was very out of character for the stipler to say such a thing. And he gave him a very warm blessing. And it happens to be that you see this story happened at least forty years ago, and uh, until today, the children and grandchildren keep the heritage. And by now, it's hundreds and hundreds of boys that eat there throughout the week and Shabbat. Eh? Obviously, the blessing worked to precise perfection. Obviously, it worked to precise perfection. That was the stipulus that I So then, Rabdan told me, the paper you can leave aside, I'll remember the name, and Be'ez Hashem will be Yeshua. And it worked exactly like that. Koch of the On the flip side, sometimes somebody would catch the stipulus with something that he liked. He liked sharp things. The stipulus enjoyed somebody who was sharp. And if you came to him with a sharp thing, then you got any blessing you wanted out of him. And one of the stories that I read today in a pamphlet that they printed from a, a tra- they transcribe word for word, shiurim of a great, great rabbi in Israel that speaks um, a couple of times a week by now. But they transcribe one shiur a week. A Baruch Rosenblum, if you understand Hebrew, you might want to try listening to him once. He's addictive um, on the intellectual level. It's not storytelling. It's very high level. Um, but he sticks in a few stories here and there because he knows that's what the generation needs. So today he stuck in a story, yeah, and, and yesterday's year he stuck in a story, and I read it from the, it was transcribed last night, I read it today, also from the stipler, that this story went famous with uh, not writing a Cholam So from then on, anybody went to the stipler, Cholam to get a blessing, nobody ever wrote a paper again. They were scared. It was Sof Sof Yavava the stipler, towards the end of his life, the last Cholam he was alive, somebody wanted to go into him and get a brocha. But by then, even screaming into his ear, it didn't work. He couldn't hear. It was, he can't write. But he wants the stipler to give him a blessing. He didn't know what to do. He thought of an idea. He went to the shul that was right near the stipler's house. And there's a sign in the shul that says, you know, to say, uh, So one of the things is, so he took off the whole plaque, the sign of the shul, and he walked into the stipler's house, and he pointed, and the stifler enjoyed that so much that that was his idea to avoid having to write a Chol HaMoed. He told him, whatever it is that you want is going to happen. And the guy says that he had such assurance in his life that thing after thing, it was just like he's been living a life of miracles ever since, and we're talking about years and years later. That was the Koch of Tzadik. Where does this Koch come from? And this, how do we tap into this strength? So this is what I want to conclude with. Malchut, kingdom. 
which one of the tribes got blessed in the parasha that kingdom goes through him Yehuda Inshallah very very soon hopefully a lot sooner than anybody could even fantasize we're going to see Melech HaMashiach and what's the contingency of somebody being Mashiach has to come from Malchut Beit David meaning Malchut Yehuda that means even the future of Kala Yisrael, even everything, past, present, future, kingdom. Now today we don't really know what it means to be a king. Uh, just look at what goes on in the Senate on a daily basis, uh, you know. It's a mockery. It's, uh, you have a guy as a president and uh, he can't do anything. Because you have a few clowns that will fight with him on everything. Now I'm not saying specifically about this president or another, I don't get involved in that, I couldn't care less. But uh, the only thing I care about is Israel's interest, and as long as Israel's interest is protected, great. Um, but that's the way it is. And that, all that in the name of democracy. <coughs> Gridlock for two years, stock market tank, economy going to recession, country going to chaos. But all of that is democracy. Crazy. Sugar. And we all fall for it too, that's the best part. And then we go like the next nutcase that's going to do that. One after another. This is, this is the cycle of of a country that doesn't think. And it's not only us, it's most of the world is that way. In Chazal, when there was kings in the times that Am Yisrael had Melachim, from Beit Yehuda, there was no such thing. Melech Poretz Geder, Chazal say. If a king says he wants this thing taken down, it's taken down. It's interesting that the example is of a wall. It's interesting, think about it. <laughs> Maybe Hashem sent a message for years later to Kaiser. What real Malchut is, is that you could make walls, break walls, you could do whatever you want. I don't know if you guys have been following the GoFundMe thing, but three days ago they started a GoFundMe that if the government doesn't want to fund the wall, we'll fund the wall. And they already raised, I don't know what they're up to, but uh, no, by now it's a few million already. And uh, today a, a clown from the other side uh, started, uh, we'll build a, fe uh, a ladder tall enough to go over the wall. <laughs> and they already raised, I wish I was joking, you could check this on GoFundMe. And, they, and when I looked today in the afternoon, they raised over a million bucks in a few seconds. Uh, yeah, that's how crazy. This is sugar, right? For kids dying, we don't have money. For people starving all over, we don't have money. To save lives of opiate addicts, we don't have money. But for this nonsense, this suddenly everybody has money to contribute. Crazy. It's a miracle with its craziness. That's Chazal say. It's Gmaran Sotan and Sanadlin twice. Then Yimot HaMashiach, Hashem is going to take the Seichel away from people. They're going to become crazy. We see it clearly. Anybody who's an intellectual will be like an outcast. Who cares about brains? We care about our agendas now. Don't confuse me with the facts, they say. No. Chazal, when they want to discuss Gmarak Tubot Kufei, Ma'i dekhtiv melech b'mishpat yamid aretz v'ish trumot yarsena, Ima dayan domed ha-melech sh'ein tzarich l'klum yamid eretz, v'im domed ha-kohen sh'em chazer al ha-granot, Yael Sena. What does that mean? Chazal over here say a prediction. They didn't mean it as a prediction maybe, but it's literally a prediction for what we see today in the Jewish rabbinic world. He says, if you want to be a leader, what's the first condition to be able to be a leader and to be able to build something that will last? Come Chazal and say that there's two types of people. There's a king who's rich. One of the criteria of having to be a king, of being a king is you have to be wealthy, meaning you don't need anybody's salary, you don't need anything from anybody. And then there's a Kohen. A Kohen provides a wonderful service in the Beit HaMikdash that the whole Am Yisrael needs, but he's poor, he doesn't have money. How does he have money? That we give him parts of the Kobanot, Trumot, Maasrot, there's all different halachot, the Levim also get a certain Maaser. They're dependent on the community. Comes the Gemara and says, if somebody wants to be a Melech, and I want to add on, the Gemara says, Man Malchei Rabbanan, who are the kings of today that tell me, Dei Chachamim? Mm -hmm. If you want to be able to take a podium, and be able to speak, and be able to teach people something, that something will actually come out of, then you have to be like a Melech, that you don't take a salary, that you're not getting paid to be there, that you're not bribed financially, that you don't owe an answer to any board, that you don't have to say anything to anybody. Because then you could say the truth. But if you like the Kohen that depends on the donation of the president of the shul that's going to reinstate your salary 
and oy vavoy to the generation that we got to today, that most of the presidents of the shul are mechalei Shabbat b'faresi or worse. So what melech? You're an evid. And if, when they brought you to speak somewhere, they're paying you $5,000, so they could write the script for you in advance, what you're allowed to say, and what you're not allowed to say. What melech? You're less than an evid, you're a shifcha even. You're a janitor at that point. And I have harsher words to use, but I'm being a little selective. There's a gemara. There's a gemara. If we look deep in this world of Chazal, Chazal is also telling us another thing. Who's the real melech in this world? Who's the real king today? There is no kings today. Who's the king today? Don't tell me Putin. I know that story. He might be the richest man in the world. That's true. He might be somewhat of a lunatic that could blow the whole world up too. That's also true. Um, he happens to be, have been relatively good to Israel lately, so maybe that's why he's still in power. And the day he won't be, Hashem will already take him away quickly. And uh, just like all other son of Israel, and... What's a melech? So the Torah describes a melech, somebody, somebody who's in control of his actions. Somebody who doesn't operate on impulse. He operates out of intellectual decision. When a person puts on himself, at that point he becomes a melech. He's a king. Some people in a shallow way, and this is, again, the millennial kids, they think to themselves, wait a second, I have 630 mitzvot, that makes me a slave. <coughs> no. If I can stick to 630 mitzvot, which today there's only a couple of mitzvot, Chavot Chaim makes a calculation, there's almost no mitzvot left, because most of them are only in times of the bit Mikdash, and only for Kohanim, and only for Leviim, and only certain days of the year, and only, and only, and only, by the time you deduct all of that, Chavot Chaim makes a calculation, and in total is maybe 50, and even out of those, they're not mitzvot midiot of every day. Every day it's maybe 5 or 6, the rest is just... On Pesach, Matzah, and Sukkot, Sheikh Lulav, and so on. So it's discount after discount after discount. But if I can say no, then I'm a Melech, I'm a king. If I can't say no, then I'm an Evid, I'm a slave. Why did Yehuda get Malchut and nobody else? Uven was the Bechor, he gets Pishnaim, he should have got the kingdom. Yosef was called Sadiq. Midat HaYisod, after everything he's been through, he also had in his DNA, he was the king of Egypt. If anything, uh, <coughs> let's give it to him. Dafka Yehuda, Yehuda, he was the one who got kingdom. Why did he get kingdom? Come Chazal HaKdoshim and say one reason, one simple reason. Yehuda had a situation with Tamar, and it was an uncomfortable situation for him. It was after he was thrown out of his father's house, and he was just rebuilding his career, we would call it, in a very shallow way as a mashal. And now he's in power, he's the Av Beit Din, and he has an episode with Tamal coming, and he says the halacha is that she should be killed. And then he realizes, wait a second, I'm part of this. And now he has to make a choice. And when we were in school, we were taught that the choice was to let her be killed, or to admit that it's his mistake, his problem, and at that point, she doesn't have to be killed and everything's okay. But then he looks very bad. There was a third option. That they didn't teach us in school. But the Midrash teaches it does. He could have done something else. He could have stopped the Beit Din and said, I rethought it, and he was the Av Beit Din, he was the boss. And Al-Pi al is not enough evidence, and she's innocent, and she doesn't have to be killed. And then he didn't have to take the blame for himself, he would have came out okay, and she would have been saved, and then life would have went on. That seems like the best option, no? But Yehuda had such truth to him, that when he was wrong, automatically, no matter what the consequences would be, or how embarrassing it would be for him, he had to say, it's me, it's my fault, I made a mistake. Because great people are measured, not by how much they know, but how much they're willing to admit they didn't know. How many times a person was willing to say, he tzadka me many, she's right and I'm wrong. That's how a great person is measured. Are you willing to own up to your own actions, even at the cost of your own embarrassment and your own discomfort and 
things that bother you and are against your career interest. A hundred percent against your career interest. Come Chazal and say, Yehuda gained many, many things from that. One of the things he gained was Hashem promised him at that moment that from there on, kingdom belongs to him. Because somebody who has such intellectual self-control is able to live on such a high level of honesty, that's who's supposed to lead Kali Yisrael forever. Because he'll never be biased to anything else. That's number one. Number two, what was supposed to happen over there? Tamar, and she was pregnant, not just pregnant, with twins, three people, would have went and been burnt. Sreifa. Not literally, but mitat uh, sreifa. The resemblance of being burnt. Another thing that, 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 would have, that, that also happened is that Yehuda would have fell into the lion's den. He would have uh, came out not, you know, not doing the right thing. Comes to Midrash and says, like Hu told Yehuda, and the reward that you saved the woman and the two children from going into the fire at the expense of putting yourself in a lion's den, meaning getting yourself into trouble. I'm going to save Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they go into the fire, and I'm going to save Daniel from the lion's den. And like this, the Midrash lists on and on and on a long, long list of all different merits that a person has. This week we're going to go to shul and read in the Chumash, Many blessings the Yaakov Avinu gave the Shvatim. These blessings apply until today. It says it clearly in the Zohan Parashat Vayichi. Everybody can tap into every one of those blessings. These blessings encompass everything a person needs in his life, down to the tiniest detail. But there's one contingency. And the contingency is, is that a person is willing to make a stride towards being an honest man intellectually. And not to be scared to say, I was wrong. Big deal. People make mistakes. And to give you chizuk on this idea that it's not the end of the world, Rav Nachman writes, we said this hundreds of times probably in the past tw- almost 20 years that we're speaking, that the two greatest mistakes that mankind make is one is that great people don't make mistakes. And the second one is, is that if a great person makes a mistake, he's no longer a great person. How many times Chamavadi Yosef Zechat Tzadik Livacha write something in a tshuva and years later say that he takes it back and the halacha is different even though when he originally wrote it he had a great case he was an ish emet he was looking for the truth he wasn't looking for his honor he wasn't look- there was nobody that would have caught him with the amount of sources that he knew most people didn't even know these fatim exist nobody could catch him he didn't have to pull it back but he looked for truth he looked for right and wrong and not emotionally right and wrong not what feels right and wrong what's intellectually right and wrong. Let's grab on to the last drop of intellect that maybe is left amongst the Bnei Torah and those who still have a connection with the something ethical and use that intellect to be our measuring stick and not to be scared to say I made a mistake. I was wrong. And tomorrow's another day. And when HaKash Bochus sees that a person says he made a mistake and tomorrow's another day, by Hashem he's an, he becomes the highest level that could be. Not only is he not second class, he's the highest level. And if a person's willing to live an intellectually honest life on that level, comes Hashem and says, Mida keneged mida, I give you back all the brachot, not only of Malchut Beit Yehuda, but of the entire Shvatim, because most of the Shvatim we don't have today, we don't know where they are. When Mashiach comes, we'll figure it out, but until then we don't know where. There's a lot of theories and whatever, but there's nothing that's worth repeating, because there's nothing concrete enough. Um, and so then we'll know. But until then, whatever Shvatim we know, Yudah, Binyamin, whatever that we're from, somewhere in the middle there, um, that we do have. So Hashem gives us the blessing of all. So Beza Hashem, this week, it's, it's the end of the Chumash. It should be a week of Chazak, Chazak, Vinit Chazak, a week that should make Kali so stronger. And again, we had another hard week in Israel with all these terror attacks and killings. And this week it, was, uh, it got even worse. Jews killing Jews over money and stupidity and... Hashem Yerachim, we should never know. And we have to daven to Hashem, we have to cry to Hashem. Hashem should say, Dalit Tzarotein, there should be enough for the Tzarot of Am Yisrael. And Am Yisrael should see Yeshua Gdola. And he should protect, especially our young kids, the soldiers on our borders of Israel, that are risking their lives every second of the day and night in order to keep our land safe from Mechovat HaYishtadlut, not beyond that. And obviously, Kalachomer, our Talmidei Yeshiva, that spiritually are protecting the borders of the land of Israel. And he should give the corrupt politicians 
at least not to be corrupt when it comes to playing with people's lives and make the right decisions that are not based on politics but based on the safety. I don't know if you've seen in the news, they've, the Hezbollah in the north dug tunnels into Israel, Gaza and this one and that one dug tunnels from the other place. This week they think another city has tunnels, they wrote already they got to a kilometer in. They did, they're digging tunnels everywhere. They're digging tunnels anywhere. I'm not God, I don't know why they're doing this, but we're catching them. Hashem makes nest after nest, we catch them in time before they get to do any damage. And I go, Shorosh, you continue making us nisim and niflaot bezrat Hashem for the sake of the cloud, to protect Am Yisrael, and for the sake of the prat bezrat Hashem. And we should see, b'sarot avot yishorot v'nechamot v'chol tuv, amen v'amen.